Well, good morning. As pastor, I get to go to a lot of weddings. And uh, weddings are always happy events, regardless of uh, the couple's budget or even the culture. And uh, one of uh, our family's favorite movies is Bride and Prejudice. It's a Bollywood spoof on Pride, Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. And it's a Bollywood film, so it's a lot of fun, a lot of music. But we like it because of the, the, look at, uh, uh, the cult cultural look at an Indian wedding. Uh, when we lived in Japan, I was expected to perform weddings as part of out, an outreach method. And also, uh, just because I was an American pastor living in Japan, it was kind of expected that I help the community by doing Western weddings. You see, weddings in Japan have gotten so expensive that many young couples would, would choose a Western-style wedding because they were cheaper. Now, this one particular wedding, I was uh, performing in Japanese, and there was this young couple in front of me, and they were standing there so nervous, they could hardly say their vows. He was sweating profusely. Okay, let's pause the story. Up until this particular moment, I had never confused two Japanese words in my life. <laughs> Ninjin is carrot. Ninjin is people. <laughs> Continuing with the story. <laughs> Just before I walked out the door to perform this wedding, this missionary, to be funny, said, Hey, don't confuse Ningen, Ninjin. So this guy is standing in front of me sweating. He can hardly talk. The lady, the bride is doing a little better. And of course, as I got them confused and I called them carrots. <laughs> it broke the ice and the couple was able to finally relax a little bit. So even though there's major cultural differences in wedding ceremonies, nearly every culture has a wedding celebratory meal at the end. Today we're looking at two parables that, that are the celebration meals. Uh, this summer we're going through all the parables of Jesus, not all 40 of them, uh, but most of the longer and important ones. And those stories may seem childish compared to, say, the deep theological truths of Paul's writings. They are how we think. From infancy we learn, uh, by example, this is like that. And so Jesus taught us in parables so that we would get the message. Just a few random thoughts about, message, about weddings. Weddings are happy affairs and usually the high point of a village life. Who was and who was not invited really affected your social standing in the, in the community. We don't know a lot about the actual ceremony in the ancient Near East, but we know that it culminated in a wedding feast. Did you know that there's a psalm that's all about weddings? Psalm 45 is all about weddings, and weddings are frequently used in the Bible as illustrations. It is also likely that Jesus used the, the same wedding, well, all the same parables, but he, like, you know, like a politician, they have their stump speech. Well, Jesus probably had all these parables, and he adapted them to the audience as he was led by the Holy Spirit. So that's why there's so many similarities in, in, like today's parables, you'll find both in Matthew and Luke. And in today's parables, we're going to look at Matthew's version. In the first one, Jesus confronts the, the Pharisees and religious leaders. And in the second one, he actually is discipling his, his, his followers. In our first parable, Jesus is teaching in the temple courts. The chief priests and elders are in the audience listening on. This is like being in Rome or Washington, D.C., all rolled into one. And the politicians and political and religious leaders are right there. Jesus is surrounded by men who see him as a threat to the status quo. And this is the third story in a row where he casts these religious leaders in a poor light. It is a very, very tense moment. Why don't you sit back and listen as I read the parable. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify those who were invited. But they all refused to come. So he sent other servants to tell them, the feast is prepared, the bulls and fatted calf have been killed and everything is ready. Come to the banquet. 
But the guests he had invited ignored them and went their own way, one to his farm, another to his business. Others seized his messengers and insulted them and killed them. The king was furious and sent out his army to destroy the murderers and burn their town. And he said to his servants, The feast is ready, and the guests I invited aren't worthy of honor. Now go out to the street corners and invite everyone you see. So the servants brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike, and the banquet hall was filled with guests. But when the kid king came in to meet the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing the proper clothing for a wedding. Friend, he asked, how is it that you are here without wedding clothes? But the man had no reply. Then the king said to his aides, bind his hands and feet and throw him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Wow. Now the Pharisees knew he was talking about them. And later in the day, they actually make plans on how to trap Jesus. Now, even though God's son, the bridegroom, is in the story, this story is all about the invitation. It's about the servants who deliver the invitation, the rejection of the invitation by those who were expected to accept the invitation, and the unexpectedness of, of it being thrown open to everyone. Now, normally a king would invite those who were close to him or those who, who had political alliances, and it's doubtful that anyone would reject an invitation from the king. Yet, these religious leaders are rejecting God's invitation. They were the anticipated ones to receive the invitation, but they have refused a second invitation is given, but the servants are, are beaten and killed. You have to think of John the Baptist here. Finally, a third invitation is given to all the people. Invite everyone you see. The privileged lose their place of privilege. And now the first are last and the last are first. This parable is a warning. It's an acceptance. We are called to accept God's invitation or be replaced. For example, the book of Hebrews says... Today, when you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. And Jesus said, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. These religious leaders have rejected the king's invitation through the biblical prophets to God's wedding. Now, this story has a couple of twists, a couple of absurdities to catch the listener's ear. I, I wonder if it caught your ear. The very first thing is that the timing is not realistic. It takes time to raise an army and it takes time to capture a city, but nevertheless, the food is ready to go the whole time. Right. It probably takes weeks or months to capture a city, right? And yet the food is still there, fresh and ready to go. God's invitation still stands, friends, regardless of what's going on out there. The second thing to notice is the, the individual not wearing wedding clothes. Now, that's equally absurd because, after all, he was just invited. He was just pulled off the street. When did he have time to go home and change his clothes? Secondly, how can he go home if the city's been burned to the ground? You're supposed to catch that. See, it's not about the clothing. It's all about the heart. Now, the important for us is that let's invite everyone we know to God's grand wedding feast. Regardless of social or moral condition or ethnicity, the invitation of God's salvation is open to everyone. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest fields. Let's become inviters. A survey not too long ago said that something, something crazy like 80% of your neighbors would come to church if you invited them. Think about that. A huge number, if you invited them, would come to church. Remember, secondly, God's church is imperfect now. You're not going to find perfect people sitting next to you. 
This one might be hard for some of you to understand, but, but the church is made up of good and bad right now. Just like the parable of the wheat and the weeds. We cannot tell the good from the bad. We must give space for other people. Other people are not going to live up to your expectations, so don't judge them. In the end, God is going to look to their heart and judge them. I like this one in Romans that says, Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master they will stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. And finally, you and I who have accepted God's invitation, we are among the chosen people. On the one hand, we as believers have an assurance of salvation. We are among the called, the elect, and the faithful. And the religious leaders refused that invitation. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I have chosen you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. In this parable, we see, we see positive and we see negative. The positive is that the invitation is thrown open to all. The negative is that the door is shut. There is a deciding factor. Isn't that how it is at weddings? We're happy and we celebrate the potential life that there lies ahead for the young couple. But we also know that sometimes reality will hit them, right? Life is tough. So on the other hand, this parable has a harshness to it. And this troubles our American sensibilities. We want everyone to be able to do as they please and everyone to get along and it work out okay. Many times you've probably heard your neighbors or your friends say, how can a good God send someone to hell? Well, again, I'm going to repeat this, what I said a few weeks ago. Our concept of love without judgment is wrong. Love and evil are incompatible. Because if God tolerates evil, then he is evil. If God tolerates injustice, he is not worthy of our worship. Because he does not love his creation. Therefore, for true love, there must be justice and judgment. Further, God has provided a, a, a path for them to be saved. Condemned people have willingly chosen their path. Jesus provided a solution by Jesus on the cross. The invitation is given. It is up to them to accept it. This parable is like bookends. It begins with a grand wedding feast and it ends with an invitation to all. All who are willing. So the background is celebratory. It, it, even though it's kind of a dark parable and some are, are cast out, the background is celebration. In anticipation of that day, we are with Jesus. Okay, let's go on to the next parable. In the next story, Jesus has left the temple and he's out with the disciples on the Mount of Olives. And he's sitting there teaching them and they ask him, what sign will signal your return and the end of the world? He doesn't answer that question, by the way. Instead, he tells them a parable. The, then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps. But the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming! Come out and meet him! All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, We don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, Believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return." Okay, well, these young ladies were apparently supposed to accompany the, the groom from the groom's house to his father's house. Most of the wedding ceremonies occurred at the, at the groom's home, the groom's father's house. And this was some sort of procession. Uh, and the, the importance of the delay of the groom is simply to highlight that these bridesmaids were not prepared. These five were not uh, prepared. 
Now, there is a twist here as well, a little thing to keep the interest, sleep. Let me, let me start this section of the thought by saying, have you, can you even imagine a bridesmaid falling asleep before the wedding? No, they're going to be worried about their hair, their nails, their dress, do I look fat in this? Oh, you look pretty, etc. I mean, there's a thousand details just before the wedding. They are not going to fall asleep. So that's part of the twist. That last sentence is, keep watch. Now, that implies that they are to stay awake, and yet all ten of them fall asleep, right? So that's just an interesting little thing in, in, the, in the story. Uh, we're not to be too upset by it. it it's to keep the listener listener's attention. The problem wasn't the sleep, but it was the lack of preparation. And when the midnight call came, the five foolish ones just did not have time to go get oil. Their lamps were burning before they fell asleep, but the wise ladies had brought extra oil. It's probably a stick with some um, cloth on the top that was rolled in oil. And when they were asleep, they began to flicker and go out. Don't worry about where they buy oil. Again, it's just at midnight. It's just a good story. The main point is that these foolish young ladies missed the grand moment because of their lack of preparation. Those who were ready went with the groom. Now, there's three important things for us. Because of the delay, we are to be alert. You and I are to keep watch. We do not know the hour of Jesus' return. We should continue to honor God's calling on our life in this world. We should be wise about the things of this world. After all, these five bridesmaids, they did fall asleep. They were lulled into thinking that everything was okay. How much this world, we get, get so acquainted with the world and the stuff of this world that we, be, we fail to realize the importance of the unseen supernatural and the realities of what's coming. They... We should remember also that there is a final judgment. Someday, some will be shut out. Okay, what's all this about the oil? What is the oil? The oil is perhaps the most important part of all this. The oil represents what I believe is an act of faith in Jesus. As believers, sometimes we think that all we have to do is raise our hand, pray the prayer, and that's it. We're done. We walk out of here. No! We are to have a living and active Faith in Jesus, a daily conversation with the Holy Spirit. Not just special times of prayer, but we should have an ongoing head conversation. Our self-talk should include the Holy Spirit. You know, you're driving down the road and you see somebody that is in trouble. You say, God, just bless them. Bless them. And the Holy Spirit may say, go back and talk to them. That, that, you have to open up and have that sort of daily act of faith and let the whole, give space for the Holy Spirit to work in your life. The Bible says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. It should, our daily living faith should include reading the Bible, participating in church services, and growing in our faith. I love how in the movie The Chosen, um, I watched it last night just to refresh my memory, and uh, Jesus is at a wedding in Cana, and not only does he perform the miracle, uh, this is in the movie, not, it's not in the Bible, but in, not only in the, mo in the movie he, does he turn the water into wine, he plays with the children, and he is seen many times dancing and having fun. He is a hilarious Jesus at the wedding. He, for example, I'll give you one little thing. Uh, not Thomas, Thaddeus. Thaddeus is talking to Mary Magdalene, and, uh, and, and Mary Magdalene is shocked to find out that Thaddeus meant Jesus building an outhouse. Just a fun, just to highlight that the, the, the Jesus was a fun guy. By using weddings as a backdrop in his message to these par two parables, Jesus highlights two points. Sadly, on the one hand, 
There is a day of judgment coming. He has told us repeatedly there will be a division, the sheep and the goats, the good fish, the bad fish, the wheat and the weeds, the wearing of the garments, the not wearing of the right garments, having oil and not having oil. He has repeatedly told us there is a coming day of judgment. Get ready. Happily, he has also emphasized that God's invitation is open to all who believe. It is so wonderful you can sell everything, you, you should sell everything to ha you have to get it. It is the pearl of great price. It is like a buried treasure in, a la in the field. It is an invitation to celebrate God's goodness and his grace upon you. It is like a wedding, hallelujah, shouting and dancing and great joy. It is like celebrating the return of the lost son or the lost coin or the lost sheep. I think Jesus told wedding parables to encourage his disciples. Israel was occupied by Rome and they were, kept raising their taxes, so much so that people were being driven into poverty and the government was so crooked. Ah, sound familiar? In dark times we need hope and celebration, folks. Weddings offer hope and joy to people as they celebrate the potential of new life together. In the book of Revelation, we see another mention of wedding feasts. You and I are the bride of Christ. There's a band that is singing a song in the background of this feast. Hallelujah, these are the lyrics. Hallelujah for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Friends, you are especially chosen by God. You are like hand-selected fruit, especially chosen by God. An angel opens the door, looks you in the eye and says with a smile, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. That's you. The invitation stands today. On two occasions, Jesus said, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. If you have not accepted God's invitation to a wedding, but his grand wedding banquet, I encourage you today, what's keeping you? What's keeping you? There is a grand life ahead of you. The invitation is for all to receive God's wonderful gift of salvation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, let your word go down deep into my heart. Lord, I know that during first service, many, many of my closest, uh, most solid Christ followers are here in this service. So Lord, I just pray your blessing upon us. Lord, help us to be inviters. Help us to go out and invite others to your wedding feast. Help us to not reject the invitation, but help us to be like those faithful servants going out into the highways and byways and inviting everyone to attend. Let your blessing be upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. If perhaps you have not accepted God's wonderful invitation, I'd really like to talk to you after the service, so please come see me afterwards. Well, today is Communion Sunday. And so would you take a moment and grab your little communion? We do communion the second Sunday of the month to remember what Jesus did. You will see not only in well, you'll see the, the dark and the promise, the, the, the sadness and the celebration in what I'm about to read. This is the night of the Last Supper. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. That's the dark side, the sacrificial side, the in our place side. Sin is a serious matter, 
and it required a serious response from God. God had to deal with the, in, the injustice of sin because he loves us. And so that part is the sad part. But then we also see the celebration part, a hint at the celebration when he says, I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The hope, the hope of celebration, the hope of seeing Jesus face to face, dancing with him in heaven, celebrating. All in the same picture here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus to deal with the sin issue. Lord, he went through all the suffering. He, in my place, he took the punishment to deal with my sin because he loves us. And it's a serious matter. And, he, and you cannot just overlook sin. You have to deal with it. Otherwise, you would, be, you would tolerate evil and you'd be evil. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for what he did on Calvary for us. And, Lord, I also thank you for the promise of the grand celebration the hope of heaven that one day we will sit down and feast with Jesus at a grand banquet. Oh, there will be joy, there will be dancing, there will be testimonies of deliverance and testimonies of power and of faith. Oh, Lord, we will shout and we will be so joyous on that day. So, Lord, we receive these elements in a bittersweet manner. We're sad at what it cost you, but we rejoice for that day and the hope that we have. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's eat and drink together. The passage of Scripture I like to read from in Matthew always ends with this. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. If I could have the worship team come. I'm going to have you stand and we're going to sing one more song. And it's about the overcoming blood of Jesus.